Robert Oko's murder in February 1990 remains to be Kenya's most prominent assassination after that of Tom Boyer. A cabinet minister in charge of foreign affairs was uprooted from his home in the dead of the night, only for his body to be discovered four days later while still burning at a hill near his home in Koru, present-day Kisum County. Now, four regimes have governed Kenya so far, but Oko's killers are yet to be identified. Instead, suspects, witnesses, or close associates to Oko have died mysteriously in the process. This is NTV Presents. My name is Duncan Haimba. Robert John Oko was Kisumu Town Member of Parliament and Kenya's Minister for Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation when he was assassinated on the night of 12th and early morning of 13th February 1990. The minister was among an 83-member delegation that had accompanied President Daniel Moy to the United States on January 27, 1990 to attend a prayer breakfast meeting in Washington, D.C. on 1st February. Upon jetting back into the country on Sunday 4th, it is reported that Oko visited the then Internal Security Permanent Secretary Hezekiah Oyugi at his home for what was described as an urgent meeting. Then, Monday at 9 a.m., Oko, together with his PS Bethel Kiplagat, went to State House Nairobi for a meeting with President Moy and then, then Canadian High Commissioner. Later that day, he left for his Koru home in Kisumu. The family remained behind. Oko had left Nairobi for good. Unknown to him, he was living on borrowed time. A cloud of death was dancing in the air, hanging over his head. The next 11 days were dramatic, tragic, and heartbreaking. First, he was involved in a suspicious road accident at Awasi on his way home, which he escaped unhurt. A few days later, he was abducted from his home on the night of February 12th. Four days later, on Friday 16th February, his charred body was found at the foothill of Got Alila, three kilometers from his Koru home. Reports indicate it was still burning. One of the country's top ministers had been assassinated. This are the images obtained from the autopsy conducted at Nairobi's Lee Finro home. Oko's body was barely recognizable and one might easily mistake it for a log of wood pulled from the fire. Detectives from Scotland Yard had a hard time extracting samples from the charred body. Those who murdered the minister seem to have had instructions to ensure he should not be recognized. Only his face and skull saved the day, making it slightly easier to have the body identified. Government pathologist Jason Caviti had concluded suicide as the cause of his death. But when the Scotland Yard detectives assessed the remains, their verdict was a resounding no. It was an assassination. His skull seen at this point on the table was taken to London's Guy's and St. Thomas Hospital and has never been returned to the country nor handed over to the Oko family. Veteran journalist Caleb Atemi and photographer Yahya Mohammed from Daily Nation's Kisumu Bureau were the first scribes to arrive at the scene. They found police officers all over Got Alila Hill 
supposedly conducting a search for a body. Meanwhile, a 17-year-old Hearts boy Patrick Shikuku had already spotted the remains and informed two individuals who immediately alerted area chief and the information was relayed to local police in Koru immediately. But uh, when I came to the scene, it didn't make sense why they were searching the body that had already been found. So I believe that the, the national system uh, organized a search so that they can make uh, the story appear to be authentic. Uh, yeah, Mohammed and I were also just walking around the hill. Then I stumbled upon the, the remains and called Oyaya. Yeah, yeah. um, but uh, we never got to release the photos because they take over, they take your, your film and everything. When they filed their report, it was described as horror. It was a charred body and was still burning slowly. The, I'd, I'd, I'd covered a few deaths as a reporter and I was, uh, I was familiar with what they call medical terms regimotis, when the body takes a pugilistic uh, stance. So here was uh, the remains of an individual. The skull is familiar, but then the, the hands are in this pugilistic position, but it's actually bones. And the rest of the, of the body up to the legs is ash. So it has a skeletal version of the, of the legs, the entire torso is burnt off and still burning. Um, then it's just the hands and the skull that is remaining. Scotland Yard detectives led by Superintendent John Troon arrived in the country five days later on February 21st to investigate the horrific murder, taking over from the Kenya police since it was already seen as a government-sanctioned elimination. Oko's body had been burned almost beyond recognition. And we immediately, that afternoon, undertook a second post-mortem on the body of uh, Dr. Ruko. There was at least 20 people there from the Kenyan government side, which should not have been there in the first place, but they were. But th they included Nguka, they included Kaviti, the government pathologist at that time, and lots of others, but they kept back. This PM went on for four hours or so. The state of the body was an awful state. All the chest area had disintegrated and gone where they had poured diesel fuel over it and set it alight. Of course, diesel takes a long, long time. It's not like petrol will go woof. Diesel will just burn slowly through the body. So I think uh, the, the, the face was deliberately left so that they can identify the person and probably make a statement that uh, whoever pursues the path that uh, Oko was pursuing could also follow the same, same route. A five-liter jerry can, a matchbox, a pair of gumboots, a five-cell torch that was still on, a briefcase, a walking stick, and a jacket that had a pistol were items that were found beside Oko's burning body. According to the former Daily Nation journalist, a narrative that the late minister had died by suicide could not add up, considering his ankle had been broken and he had also been shot on the head. What made me curious was that when we arrived, the, the entire hill was, 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 was dry. The grass was actually golden brown. That time of the, of the year when the, the sun is scorching. So when I said that uh, the fire consumed him to the, to the bone, but only burnt a small portion of grass around him, my story appeared together with uh, a, government, um, a government piece trying to create a picture of, uh, of suicide. So we had my splash and a government statement. So university students are the ones who picked up the narrative. I began saying, how could he have killed himself? When the nation says he was burned to the bone. And then they began rioting and throwing stones. So I think that's what changed. Uh, and I think took the government to, in, in, into shock because uh, 
that narrative couldn't work anymore. The late Ambassador Bethel Kiplagat was the permanent secretary in Oko's Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Ambassador Dr. Kipiego Cheluget was five years old in the ministry, while Brudy Nabuera was Oko's cabinet colleague. Questions lingered why was Ouko assassinated and by whom? Answers have never been given and might never be given. Oh, that one was, is a tough one uh, for me personally. The mysterious way he, he died was so painful that even up to today, uh, you know, it's still a mystery what, what really happened. It was not an iota that something was not going well. Uh, he had people who are against him or looking for, I just couldn't understand. That's what makes it so painful when the person just disappeared and then found him murdered as far as I'm concerned. Robert Ouko's death uh, was a puzzle uh, because Robert Ouko was very loyal to the system. And in his, in his own way, it was difficult for me, as a member of parliament and a minister, a colleague of Robert Uko, to accept the fact that Robert Uko would be a threat to the system. So to me, it still remains a puzzle uh, why Robert Uko would be assassinated. A country that um, has such a prominent person dying in such a way, um, you are foreign minister. We had all the contacts around the world who was well respected. Uh, is killed in a casual way, in, in a very brutal way like that. It had a terrible impact. Um, I think many countries were viewing Kenya as not, safe, not a safe place. As to why such a high-ranking government official was brutally killed, several motives behind the death were advanced. One, a fallout with President Moy's kitchen cabinet as a result of President Moy's visit to USA. A second motive was a dossier on corruption scandal he was about to release regarding Kisumu Molasses processing plant and other graft matters that would have implicated then Energy Minister Nicholas Biwot, Agriculture's Elijah Mwangale, as well as Vice President and Minister for Finance, Professor George Saitoti. The third theory was local politics, whereby Job Omino, whom Ouko had defeated during the 1988 election for Kisumu Town parliamentary seat, was identified as a person of interest. Then, family feud was also listed owing to the fact that at the time of his murder, he was not seeing eye to eye with his two younger brothers, Barack Mbaja and Collins. Then there was also an aspect of a love affair. The last three were easily knocked off, leaving power struggles in Moy's kitchen cabinet and corruption as possible causes. Before traveling to the U.S. for the prayer breakfast, Kenya's ambassador, Dennis Afande, had advised that the trip be rescheduled. However, President Moy insisted on traveling. In America, President George Bush declined to meet Moy one-on-one, -on -one, but instead met three African presidents all at once in a hotel and not in the White House. As a result, it was Robert Ouko in his capacity as Foreign Affairs Minister who addressed a news conference trying to save face for Kenya, especially on infringement on human rights, whereby several politicians and activists were serving years in detention without trial as agitation for multipartism intensified. This is said to have infuriated Ekabal in Moy's inner circle who felt that he was being groomed to dislodge Moy from power. We believe sincerely were due to misunderstanding and misrepresentation of facts about the situation in Kenya. When a group of people go underground and take an oath to overthrow a government constitutionally elected into parliament, uh, and the government uh, 
and then take action to make sure that peace is preserved in the country. We do not see human rights dimension in that process. We're dealing with criminal intent, and we're dealing with the Namana uh, uh, by the laws of Kenya, and uh, in a way consistent with the constitutional actions of our country. Uh, uh, I think sincerely there was misunderstanding and misrepresentation which you were trying to it is as if the leadership thought uh, that the superpower may think of uh, overthrowing the leadership that was there and putting helping Ouko to take over as the president. And at that time there was a lot of clamor for democracy in Kenya and uh, there were protests uh, by many, many groups about, you know, repression uh, in Kenya, political repression in Kenya. So. Uh, the president was put to task. Actually, that was the climax of all that they were thinking about. And uh, even Ouko was threatened right when he was in America. That is where he was told now, Mr. where he was called by somebody, Mr. President. It was in America. James Huatenge is a former member of the then Lethal Special Branch Unit, Force Number P Stroke Number 123274, that was responsible for inflicting torture and eliminating individuals perceived to have been anti government. He was dismissed from the service at the rank of police inspector and has lately been very generous with information on Kenya's dark past. But I'm a believer in the Bible where it says tell the truth and the truth shall set you free. So my fellow intelligence officers who are connected to the as, um, political wrongdoings, including us as nations, uh, we met with them in uh, Uhuru Park with some military people called Voka, victims of coup attempt in 19. We felt that we should come out uh, uh, openly because uh, even the intelligence officers were psychologically suffering for what they did and uh, I just found myself deep into the thing I can't come out because at that time the, the intention then was that um, these officers who wronged people should uh, go some sort of counseling but it was just left that way. He alleges that before his killing Ouko had escaped an arranged road accident in Awasi along Kisumu Kericho Road as he was traveling to his home. His assassins were on his trail all the way from Nairobi. The first officer to be on the the first officer on the scene was uh, Inspector Achesa Litabalia of the traffic. Ajesa Litabadia was later followed and killed. They blew him up with uh, this six kilos, six kilograms uh, total meko. They, that is how he died. So Ajesa Litabadia, an inspector of police traffic, uh, deputy base commander, where, as he was surveying the, the scene, drawing the way they draw, uh, Copro Barnabas Lubisia, uh, alias uh, Baluke, of the Kisumu Special Branch came. And you see this is already is in Rift Valley, outside the jurisdiction of Nyanza. This fellow came, he identified himself as a Special Branch officer and chased away the Achesa Litabalia. In, me, in a disciplined forces, an, a corporal chasing away an inspector is unheard of. On Saturday 10th February, the minister attended an event organized by the Rotary Club in Kisumu at the Imperial Hotel, where he continued praising Kanu regime, explaining his close ties with Moi. That was his last public engagement and the last time he was heard of. And you feel proud to walk around the world as a Kenyan, particularly when you're the Kenyan in charge of foreign affairs, I feel happy. <laughs> <laughs> it is good. It is good because of President Moore's efforts here and overseas. I was uh, privileged to be in New York last week, in Washington, 
And I can tell you, the Americans were a bit, were a bit surprised, pleasantly surprised. The president is a Christian, so he got hold of the Bible and he preached <laughs> for half an hour. At the end of it, almost all the 3,000 people wanted to come and shake hands with him because he said, if you ever come to Canada, don't hesitate to call me. And Americans lined up to take his telephone number. <laughs> And I want to tell you that our beloved president, His Excellency Daniel Arab Mori, has gone to Kenya more than any other person could have done. He has put me in charge of this ministry to assist him in creating, portraying, protecting a favorable image of Kenya outside Kenya. I've done this with great joy because that the real task is being done by the president himself. After he has cleared the air around the world for Kenya, I just go around to see if there's any that I can <laughs> do. On Monday night, February 12th, unknown persons abducted him from his home in Koru on the Kericho Kisumu border. Some reports indicate that Ouko knew all was not well, planned to escape, and was waiting for both Hezekiah Oyugi and former Nakuru DC Jonah Anguka, who was his close friend, to whisk him away and would leave the house as soon as their vehicles, which he was familiar with, arrived. Anguka did not go. But what I know is that uh, when the vehicles arrived, he went to open the vehicle, thinking that he was going to see Kina Anguka, Kina Oyugi, but he found uh, security personnel armed with, G G3, with rifles, let me not say G3, but with rifles, and they were putting on a jungle uniform. That is when he tried to run away. And then he was held, and when he tried to shout, he was, and you know when, when you shout and your, your, your neck is held, you make a noise like that of a goat when it's about to be killed. And that is how Selina heard it. The indications that he had planned to escape to another destination. He had changed his clothes, he was wearing a ketenga, that kind of thing. And there was uh, some bag, small bag with some clothes on. He had everything ready. And I think the people who were supposed to collect him to help him escape came with another team. And this team got him at the gate. Uh, the workers indicated that they had him cry, like a hyena, so one of them said. You know, that, that sound, that ter terrifying sound that somebody makes when they are in mortal danger. Mm -hmm. uh, shouted at the top of his voice. And I think that is when one of these abductors hit him in the leg, because I think he tried to run away. But he, they hit him on the on the umbong. You know umbong, the ankles. The minister was assassinated that night. The location where he was murdered remains in contention. According to the report of the Gore Sungu led parliamentary select committee that investigated Oko's killing, it was done in Nakuru State House as per what the former special branch police inspector informed the committee. He said Ouko was delivered in State House when he had been tortured already. He was kneeling down and in the process of kneeling down, you remember he had a broken leg, so it is so painful. But he was kneeling down, the water was on his left side and the Moi was in front of him. So the water was telling Ouko, to accept, to confess that he was planning to, over, he was undermining the president. The word is undermining. And that he was sorry and uh, he was apologizing and was to say that uh, he'll never do that again. Uh, he told the president that uh, I, can, I am a sincere friend and I can never want anything bad to you. Then be what pretended. It is, uh, 
a fake annoyance. Uh, he pretended to be annoyed, took out a pistol, shot Uko from this side, and Uko died. And then uh, Biwot apologized, immediately Biwot apologized to the president and said, Mzee, I'm just sorry, uh, I'm just sorry I was overtaken by emotions. Uh, that is what Inspector Wekesa from Misiho told me and what Inspector Kinyanji from Limuru told me. Uh, no, they say this person was taken to State House, Nakuru, uh, for uh, torture and interrogation. And uh, I think by the time he was reaching Nakuru, they were almost done with him. And then whoever wanted to interrogate him, now why bring somebody up? You are done with him. So he, then, I think according to the investigation, they thought, found a way of making sure he's dropped back wherever and possibly his body mutilated. Yeah. He was not taken to Nakuru like the report says. That we had to do because of members insisting that we write what was given us as evidence. But when I talked to Troon, Superintendent Troon, of Scotland Yard, he specifically mentioned having seen damage marks on guava leaves where Uku had been found lying dead. It was very clear from the pathologists from Scotland Yard, there's no way he would have been killed at Guatalila. He was killed elsewhere and the body brought to Guatalila uh, to allow the discovery. Now, according to the Scotland pathologist, after being killed, he was actually grilled. It was like Nyamachoma. His body was, was taken through fire, of burning and toasting. And then Noach was brought to the scene, and according to the pathologist, they, they poured uh, something probably, some, probably like diesel to enhance the, the burning of the remains, but he, he, he was killed elsewhere and brought there. If, if he had been killed there and burnt there, then the entire hill would have, would have set a blaze. Now, as to why he was killed, that one remains a, a mystery. Ohuko was discovered missing on Wednesday 14th February when he failed to show up at the Jomo Kenyatta International Airport to lead a Kenyan delegation to the Gambia after President Moy cancelled travelling. There would have been Oko's entourage waited for hours on end, but he was no sure. 24 hours later, state broadcaster KBC Radio and Television announced to the country that, and I quote, the family of the Minister for Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation, Dr. Robert Oko, has reported that the minister left his Koru home on Tuesday, February 13th in the morning and has not been seen since. Could Dr. Uko please contact his family or the nearest police station? Any member of the public who might have information about the minister's whereabouts should report to the nearest police station. In my view, uh, they killed him and try, probably try to, to buy time and gauge the, nation, the national mood uh, before releasing the, the story of his of, of death. The following day on Friday, February 16th, 1990, President Daniel Arap Moy issued a statement officially announcing the death of his minister in charge of foreign affairs, which read in part, it is with profound sorrow that I have to announce the death of Honorable Robert Oko. On learning of the report of his disappearance on Wednesday, the government mounted an intensive search for Dr. Oko using all means at its disposal. Dr. Oko's partly burnt body was discovered six kilometers away from his Koru home in circumstances which at the moment suggest foul play. Further investigations are being conducted into the death. 
but I would like to assure the public that anyone who may be associated with this horrible event will most certainly be apprehended and brought to justice. The special branch and CID units began to investigate the murder, but when pressure intensified, President Moy was forced to call in Britain's Scotland Yard detectives, Superintendent John Troon, Inspector Dennis and D.S. Sanderson, and Dr. Lane Eric West, a forensic pathologist who arrived in Kenya five days later on 21st February. They began at the Lee Finro home conducting a second post-mortem, disregarding the initial one that had been conducted by Chief Government Pathologist Jason Caviti. The badly burnt body, a broken ankle, a single gunshot in the skull and the theory of suicide were explicit opposites. In his examination of the body, the British pathologist extracted 10 exhibits, the clothing chest, clothing left leg, stomach, blood, urine, entry and exit wounds, skull, hair around the entry point, and denture which was returned for burial. The samples were taken to London's Metropolitan Police Forensic Science Laboratory where preliminary conclusions revealed that Robert Ouko died as a result of a single firearm wound to the head. There was nothing to indicate that the body was on fire while he was alive. The nature of the heat damage indicating a slow but intense fire which caused severe burning of the back of the trunk to the abdomen and to a lesser degree to the limbs. Nothing was found to indicate the deceased had been on fire while in an upright position. The amount of skull damage was more severe than one normally associated with a standard 38mm special round. A slightly more powerful round could produce that injury. The movement of the head, the position of the gunshot wound, and the absence of flame burns on the face indicate the fatal injury was caused by another person. The fracture on the right ankle did not occur as a result of the fire. The body was set on fire in an attempt to destroy it. The suspicious death should be investigated as one of homicide. The cause of death is a firearm wound to the head. That evening, with Oyugi, um, and the commissioner was there then, and Guka was there, and a few others in Oyugi's house. And I specifically said to Oyugi that, as far as we are concerned, there is evidence to suggest that Dr. Uko was murdered. He did not commit suicide. And Oyugi quite forcibly said to me, Mr. Troon, you are wrong. The minister committed suicide. And I said, I'm sorry, sir, but no, the evidence suggests quite contrary. He was murdered. And uh, either I'll investigate the murder or I'll go back to London, let you get on with it. And you see, when you shoot yourself, it takes 0 0.02 seconds for you to die, from the time the bullet enters your body to the time you die. And uh, that is too short a time for you now to light a match. But those are the things they did in panic. I remember when our committee went to London, I actually went personally to Scotland Yard to look at some of the files. You know, up to now, actually, Uko's skull was still held at uh, Guy's Hospital in London. And uh, the gun and so on, of course, had been taken back to the government of Israel, they were taken there. But a lot of specimens and so on still held in, the, in London. When Mo elects somebody, he elects them deeply. And from people that I've uh, interacted with, he liked Oko deeply. And that's why I believe he literally, literally risked his life. He, 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 must, he was head of state, yes. But attending the, the barrio was the major risk he took as head of state. And I think he would make a statement by, by being there. Oko's assassination led to violent protests staged by university students and residents of the lakeside town of Kisumu. 
The slain minister was buried eight days later after his body was discovered. Emotions were still raw. A cloud of anger engulfed Kisumu and his Koru home. Hearts were heavy and still bleeding with razor sharp tension being felt across the corners. The government was the main and only suspect, but it had to be a state funeral. Okomada set Kisumu ablaze. I don't think today the government has ever released figures of people who were killed in the Oko riot salon. I believe it runs into hundreds of, of individuals. Men and women were murdered, girls who were raped, men who were sodomized by security operators. It runs into hundreds. You may never know the figures. The temperatures were, were extremely high. Uh, I remember when we were driving to, to Koru pretty early, around 6 a.m. You could actually see red berets lying in the sugar plantations. So I think the entire, the entire military and the entire security capital moved to Kisumu and to Koru on the, barrio, the eve of the barrio and the barrio day. Now, all university students, all young Kenyans, had also gathered there. And they were burning. You could feel the anger. So I remember when Dolo Aya stood up to, he was like the MC, to address the crowd. First mistake, mistake he did was try and, and speak in English. And they told him, no. Dolo Aki Dolo. Address us in, in Kijalua. <laughs> and then uh, they began singing anti and anti Kanu and anti, anti Moi songs. Say that you killed Ouko, you burnt Ouko. Now eat him. So I was I was standing close to the to the dais in the late Chagin Bitiru. And uh, I just imagine now as a reporter, if a rout broke out there, no amount of force would have saved the head of state from the surging crowd. No amount of gunfire would have rescued his life. But the man stood firm. And he addressed the crowd. Now, one person I think who served, uh, who helped to sway and calm now was uh, the widow, Sister Bell. Played to the crowd that my husband loved peace. So let's offer him that respect. That's the only person they listened to. They didn't want to listen to, to Ndolo Aya or anybody else, but they listened to, Mr., to Madame Christabel. Moi, Moi just sat still. As I'm saying, uh, I look at him as a very brave man. <laughs> he just sat there, no blinking. He looked very calm. He was very sure of himself. He gave his address and drove off with his chopper. <laughs> Energy minister at the time, Nicholas B. Watt, was perceived as the main suspect. Alongside Internal Security Permanent Secretary Hezekiah Oyugi and Nakuru DC Jonah Anguka. The Scotland Yard detectives continued with their investigations and handed over their report to Attorney General Matthew Guy Mooley in September that year. President Moy established a commission of inquiry that comprised Court of Appeal judges Ivan Gisheru and Richard Quach, High Court Judge Akilano Akiumi, with Bernard Chunga as its counsel. The commission conducted proceedings in Kisumu, but after eight months on 26th November 1991, Moy disbanded the commission. The very day P.S. Hezekiah Oyugi was to appear before it, he ordered Police Commissioner Philip Kilonzo to begin fresh investigations. What followed was the immediate arrest of Nicholas B. Watt, who had been sacked from cabinet a week earlier. Powerful internal security P.S. Hezekiah Oyugi, Nakuru D.C. Jonah Anguka, Ouko's lawyer George Oraro, James Koyo, Police Officer Ajuga, Banker Paul Gondi, Ouko's house help Selina Were, his cousin Ouko 
and farm manager Philip Rodi. Why am I being arrested? I said, we don't know. Why, why are you being arrested? So they told me also to wait. <laughs> I waited there uh, anxiously. And as I was waiting, I saw Oyuki coming out of a cell and Nguga and Oraro. The, yeah, those are the ones I can remember very vividly. All those who are covered up because when they started, the, the information was coming out. Now, this information was going to put the government in, in jeopardy. And so what do they do? Because it may have reached to the top man. So they had to disorganize them so that those evidences again disappears and pretend to be arresting these people and again release them. But there is no evidence. The only route that would have saved, brought up the history was the, the Commission of Inquiry. That was a powerful commission. The judiciary one. The, the judges were brave individuals. Akiumi, Molade, Akiumi, uh, Molade, Akiumi, uh, Justice Quach, Gishere himself. These were brave individuals. And I think uh, the job was well cut out. I remember Gishere calling the media to tell them, he even asked me, are you the one who put the 22 million into my account? I said, no, no, my Lord, I have not handled that kind of money. The system, uh, put some money into their individual accounts, millions of feelings. And the commission, uh, uh, commission of, uh, commission has told the, whoever it is, through the media, please take, take back your money. You don't want it. So they were, they were, being, they were being coerced, they were being pressured, they were being threatened. I remember having a drink with the, the pathologist, <laughs> Daka Kaviti. We would seek them out in the evening for a drink and uh, just try to get a deeper story into, into the murder. So I met him at the Sunset Hotel where the commissioners were used to sleep. After a few drinks, the man burst into tears and says, If you just leave me alone, I've done my bit. I've done what they wanted me to do. Just leave me alone. So imagine you're being forced to even, even write, write a pathologic uh, report that doesn't make sense. Because the committee arrived at the scene, looked at the body, and said, yes, he committed suicide. Because <laughs> he was being pushed by the system. I think they never gave you options. You either write this, you follow the other character. All the suspects were released after 14 days, except Jonah Anguka, who was the only person charged with Oko's murder. However, the trial ended following the death of Justice Fida Hussein Abdallah in November 1992 before he could deliver his ruling. Another trial was started against Anguka in 1994, but Justice Daniel Aganyanya acquitted him of all the charges. He fled the country but later wrote a book while in exile titled Absolute Power, The Ouko Murder Mystery, in which he accused President Moi Cabinet Minister Nicholas Biwot and P.S. Hezekiah Oyugi of Ouko's heart-wrenching murder. According to a parliamentary select committee report that probed the disappearance and murder of Robert Ouko, several people who are either suspects, witnesses in Robert Ouko's case, or close associates died mysteriously. Those named include powerful P.S. Hezekiah Oyugi, Provincial Commissioner for Nyanza, Julius Kobia, and Belgut DC, Peter Mhoro. Former Police Commissioner Philip Kilonzo, who was leading investigations, dropped dead when having a drink after being tricked to receive a call, leaving his drink unattended. Others were Nyanza Provincial Police Officer Jadiel Kivaite, Provincial Criminal Investigations Officer in charge of Rift Valley Province, Nehemiah Ombati, Koru Police Station Officer Charles Nzomo, Martin Ochanda, who was attached to Kisumu Special Branch Office, who was Ouko's friend, and Joseph Yogo, Ouko's driver, among others. The guy who was handling his flight details died mysteriously. And the government took care of his burial arrangements. So the family 
and then but is we're taking care of it and then um um most people who were supposed to testify in the, in the, the nurses and doctors i'll have to go back and look at the, at the, of, of the names we just drop dead and we go but there's one person who faked her death selena ndalo the house help i think she worked pretty well with some trusted policemen and even the media brought into the issue of her being dead but she was drawn deep into the village where she stayed safely i think many years later yeah, Kilonzo was, was the height of it when he came there with the pathologist to confirm that uh, it was a cause of murder. Uh, he was at his hotel in uh, Dallas, in Dallas, enjoying, I think, I think the current witnesses, he was taking a, a Sprite, a soda. When he received a call, those days he didn't have mobile phones, he to go and get a call from the office. He came back, took a sip and collapsed. So people claim to cyanide. Oyugi was taken ill while in police custody. He died when undergoing treatment in London. It is said he died a painful death. As they told me that uh, as you see me here, I'm a dying person. Then he, he went to the narrative of the day they were arrested with the what? Was taken to I think Kilimani, a police station was kept for many hours that food and drink. So when he became thirsty, he made a fatal mistake. A mistake that people like Jaramogi avoided. When, whenever they were arrested, they would not take soda or water even in the police station. Unless it was brought by the people from home, they wouldn't drink or eat anything. Then he told me that he took that, he took a sip of that soda, I think it was also Sprite, and he passed out. He remembers when he came around, it must have been the 14 days later, that pe window period that was given by the Constitution of holding a witness. He says when he came around, he had, he, he, he had some itchy feeling at the back of his neck, and there were some scratch marks. That's what he remembers. And then he was soon told he had uh, the motor neuron disease. His body just disintegrated, and he died. Oh, Yogi died? Uh, the way he died, you know, even uh, Saitot was about to die. You know why he was dying? He was poisoned, even his skin peeled off. Uh, you know, when uh, 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 the PS died, how he looked like, and what he was. So, I don't know. I'm not a doctor, but I just believe. Uh, some people may have poisoned them or whatever. When President Kibaki regime took over, among its key priorities was revisiting some of the ills and injustices perpetrated by the Kanu regime, with Ouko assassination being one among those top on the agenda. A parliamentary select committee investigating circumstances leading to the death of Ouko chaired by then Kisumu Town Member of Parliament, Eric Gorsungu, claims his team faced roadblocks from the onset. It took us like almost six months before we could have the first sitting. Even the sitting space was a problem in Parliament, which is very unusual for a committee of Parliament. Okay? And the, you know, you could read, you could just see straight away that the people who were in charge of parliament were not happy to let it go. They were they instructed to, to put as much roadblocks as possible. And we had to do extraordinary things to make things move. As expected, the House summoned several persons of interest. But of course, the star witness was Nicholas B. Watt. Order, Mr. B. Watt, I think now you have had sufficient time. It's your passport, you must know and can confirm to us that you did not travel with Dr. Uko on 27th February 19, uh, January 1990. Can you confirm that? No. The record shows that there is an exit stamp on the 25th of January 1990. Yes, is there I another exit stamp on 27th? No, I, yeah, I don't see it, but I'm sure I went on that flight of the presidential. 
but uh, now uh, honor we what we have uh, uh, dr wuko's passport here which we can give you the benefit to check and he left on the 27th of january now do you want to tell us that you live together you was his stamp 25th and he is stamp 27th is it possible uh, at the airport that you know they they stamp different dates when you are living on the same date and did you leave were you at the airport on 25th if you were where were you going to? on the 25th and let me show you i believe you. And for the three days that Biwot appeared before the Ouko murder probe committee, sittings were punctuated with fierce exchanges between a house team seemingly determined to nail him and a besieged Biwot who appeared unshaken, leading to a standoff that saw committee sittings come to an end. All I was asking is equal opportunity with the others. If it pleases, the committee. I'll be willing to convert this into a statement. But here is a case where you want to ambush this committee by submitting a statement minus those details now you want to talk about. And then you want to now go and read them. I rule that you are out of order and you want to proceed on the basis of that. The former powerful minister stood his ground. All I'm asking is the same thing we can go. As I read the paragraph, you can ask me. Mr. B. Watt, because you are adamantly refusing to recognize the, chair, the ruling of the chair, this committee is now adjourning. And uh, I don't feel written, everything was written more or less. I wanted to present it to the committee. And then after that they will cross-examine me, but they refused. They said they, don't, they will not uh, entertain that. Now, Mr. B. what? I am inclined now to rule you out of order and rule that we must proceed as we have been proceeding i will not entertain any further questions you want to withdraw you can withdraw if you refuse. i said please let me present my side of the story and then question me so they said no so i pleaded with them they said you are intimidating them mr chairman mr chairman mr. Mr. Please, please, mr. actually who, who gives who gives a permission for people to talk here it is the chairman right now the chair has ruled and I believe I'm right, and we must proceed. If you will not, if you will insist on interceding any further, I'm going to adjourn this proceeding. Read, read to the to order. Read I think, it now, I think so that everybody will know exactly I what I read. Now, I think order of members. No, now, now we have, we have talked about these not, proceedings. Yes. We because, will now adjourn these proceedings because, because that was only. I think the proceedings are adjourned. That was only an introductory. If you read it, I had not even begun giving my evidence, and it will continue. You're shutting me out. So I insisted and I stood my ground. So they got fed up and they went. They left. The committee completed its work when it was sharply divided. Only six members allied to the ruling coalition NAC signed the report, while three who were in the official opposition party KANU refused to append their signatures and got an additional support from a member of NAC. The majority who signed the report were Gor Sungu, Dr. Oburu Oginga, Professor Christine Mango, Joe Hamisi, Rafael Bita Sauti Wanjala, and Kiema Kilonzo. Kano MPs who refused to sign were Samuel Moroto, Sami Leshore, Amina Abdala, and Peter Munya from NAC. Our report was ready within two years, and we tabled it in Parliament. I tabled it in Parliament. The next two years, the next two years, it was never discussed. The responsibility of in time, allocating time to discuss reports, bills, or anything in the House rests with the House Business Committee. Among the members are the top politicians even of today, but above all, uh, the likes of what were there. Chairman was Ole Kaparu. They 
I think that's now I remember what you are now saying. They refused to table it until I made a statement in the house, crying that why, you know, this is going to give us a bad name. Please bring it here, we discuss it. If it's to be rejected, let it be rejected. If it's accepted, let it be accepted. It was never brought in my time because if they did that, I would be able to explain to members exactly what was going on and spill some of the bills that had still left behind to, you know, because you don't give everything in a report. You must leave something for when you're doing the verbal report. And, uh, and, 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 and that were denied that chance. Former Speaker Francis Ole Caparo was accused of frustrating efforts to have the report debated. When reached for comment, he dismissed the claims, saying it was hogwash. There must be true records in Parliament. James Hwatenge is the only former special branch detective who appeared before the committee to testify. People who, who are working in special branch, some of them are leaving. At that time it was special branch, today it's called National Intelligence Service. Uh, the, the reasons why they were running away, because not all of them ran away, but few of them ran away. Few of them have suffered out of, out of this, like Watenge, uh, Wajakoyo, part of those people who ran away, and there are many the Rangukas. Baba saved me. Wakati nilikuwa na wawa na ile zirikali ya wakatili Ni baba aliyofanya kazi kubwa sana na ni, Niseme ni siseme Baba na ubalozi wa Amerikani Wewe mtu anaitwa Smith Hempstone They are the ones who rescue, rescued me from this country Wakanipeleka ngambo Wakati ya mawaja adaktari huko I tend to disagree with, 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 the, with that inspector, now, now a professor, when he says that um, he was given duty to investigate Oko's death. Luchiri Wajakoya used to work in the music room. There was a, a room where he used to dub. Uh, you know, those are the days when we had this walkie-talkie. So in the music room, we used to have uh, earphones at whatever. So they used to say that that is a music room where you listen to people. Wajakoya listened and heard the word talking to Moi on phone and he recorded it on a compact cassette where Moi was blasting the word saying Unaona vile umenifanya because if the word would not have shot you remember during Kanu meeting Moi even told the word that you are supposed to have been in jail he was referring to this and there may be other issues. In April 1992, the Sunday Times publication in London published a report that was attributed to former Special Branch Officer George Wajakoya, who was a fugitive at the time, which indicated Ouko was killed in State House, Nakuru. When contacted for comment, Wajakoya declined, saying, and I quote, kindly, Keep me out of this. Ouko's assassination remains to be Kenya's most high-profile murder in the country's history since the first assassination of politician Pio Gama Pinto in 1965. It was really a gem for the Moe government. That's why his death ran so bitter and so deep. And uh, I don't think any other death has come with so many uh, individuals falling with the key guy, like that happened in, 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 in Uko's murder. So it won't, it won't go away soon. The key suspects might have died, but we keep hoping that one day, the real story will be told. It is 33 years since the Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation Minister was murdered, but even those who probed his death can't dare mention the suspects involved, despite the process having been a public affair. For them, it is simply, can't name, won't name. I'm not even uh, afraid of anything. I just don't have the time for uh, things that will create disability in my, in my life. I want to have a peaceful retirement. I don't want to be called uh, by anybody or uh, because the things I did in parliament were parliamentary work. I've done my bit. Now it is my time. It's now my time. It made us also to be very mean with information 
And even as I'm talking to you, I'm very mean on the information, simple because someone may take me to court. But if I wanted to call Watenge or to call Wajakoya to be my witness, they would refuse. Then I would be in trouble. It's not that what you are asking me that, oh, you may you know who you know. I know. But if I say it and some of them are leaving and they participated, they say, now you have to prove. They will take me to court. Now, how do I prove I need those witnesses that were mentioned who are there? Now, if I call them, they will not accept. So I'll be in trouble. The perpetrators are in the record. If at all there was any prosecution or any interest in investigating this matter, I will rush Nairobi to give them all the details I have. Documentary and things are kept in my mind. Anytime, no government in Kenya has been willing. Uh, in Kenya, it's not just the Uko murder. In Kenya, justice looks like justice like a passing cloud. So where we reached, but we know the spirit of Uko has also worked. It has really haunted them. They have really died miserably. You see, we had also taken this uh, oath of office that whatever we learn in our official way, we cannot disclose. Actually, what I'm doing, I'm committing a crime that is called uh, under Official Secrets Act because I'm talking of what I'm, I'm not supposed to have said that. But going to jail is a smaller price than the, than the truth coming out. The committee which discharged its functions divided in the middle says there was intimidation all through to have the team bungle the process. One time, at night, I was called by somebody whose call I could not refuse. Their house in Lovington. And there, I saw who is who. And of course, no words, bad words were exchanged. But I kept wondering why I was called there at that time. Mind you, because of my position, I took my bodyguard with me, but also alerted my cousin, the then uh, Chief Inspector of Tieno. So my neighbor is late. He was the deputy OCS at Kabet. And I was his, and so he gave me extra officers to go with me, trail me as we're going in a car. Because I was wondering why would I be called in the middle of the night, almost like 11 p.m., 10 p.m., when most people have gone to bed. That really concerned me. And perhaps the reason why I'm not in Parliament now, but that's a story for another day, when I write my memoir. The former legislator says he was kept for over an hour past midnight, but no one spoke to him, neither was he offered anything, but the individuals continued with their coded conversations. And there was no meeting as such. You know, some communications can be verbal, some can be through expression, or just by seeing. So how many people were present and who were they? From a central bank. That's six people. I had to take a roundabout route with the other kind too. But anybody who, I don't know. There was no physical threat, but I wondered why I was called. There was no physical threat, because some of them were my closest friends. I think it was instructions without words. Mm. Okay. The six were a former top official in the National Treasury. 
his close associate, a powerful businessman, both from Rift Valley, a current high-ranking politician in the country, a former member of parliament and assistant minister Orwa Ojode, a top high court advocate who is now a senior counsel and a former banker. It is now 33 years since February 1990 when a herder stumbled upon the body of the late Robert Oko that had been dumped at Got Alila behind me. Now the country might have moved on and so many things, but what remains constant is the famous Got Alila, the theories and mystery that until today is yet to be unraveled on the shocking and brutal murder of Kenya's high profile politician and leader. Duncan Haemba, NTV at Got Alila in Koru.